And we're live. Dr. David Ingram, please take it away. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Science Cafe, sponsored by Sigma Xi, the Scientific Honor Society, and the Office of the Vice President for Research. I'm David Ingram, the Vice President of the local chapter at Sigma Xi, and the Chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Um, this week's cafe will be given by Jeff Diabalco, Professor of Environmental Studies. He'll, he will be speaking about pursuing climate adaption the resilience in unexpected places by unexpected means. He will detail research conducted by our university students, faculty and staff that highlights the need to move beyond the expected climate responses. He will be drawing on examples from right here in Athens County to internationally in the Balkans and the United Nations. Before we start, I've got one announcement, and that is the next and final Cafe for Four will be on Wednesday this week, given by Nathan Wayand, Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences. He'll be talking about microbial colonies and protective blood. Additional information about the Science Cafes can be found at ohio.edu slash science cafe. And now over to Jeff DiBalco. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ingram, um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Mad Bruni. It's, uh, it's a great privilege to do the Science Cafe and have this conversation, and I'll just share screen and jump right into it. Okay. Um, so, uh, as Dr. Ingram said, I want to talk about pursuing climate resilience in unexpected places, and could have also said with unexpected people, um, and hopefully with some good results. Um, I'm say a, a word about kind of the two places I'm coming from, up on the ridges at the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs and the Environmental Studies Program uh, for the last uh, eight years as a professor there. And then the other building is the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, it's in Washington, D.C. It's where I worked for 15 years before coming back to, to Athens, back to my hometown and, and Ohio University. And so um, the examples in the discussion today, I think it's important to know, come from both um, uh, academia and scholarship and research in that realm, but also in this kind of Washington-based but nonpartisan, non-advocacy forum to bring um, researchers together with practitioners is the Wilson Center uh, mission. So uh, climate change, um, all sorts of ways that we can depict the challenges that we face. It could be fires, it could be brimstone, it could be uh, extreme weather events, and those are all absolutely relative, relevant um, and, and ways to tell that story. I chose one, uh, a cartoon that's a bit more political in, in terms of the competing responses it, with the multiple crises. So in the midst of COVID, we have a the push for uh, transition to renewable energy and a green economy. Um, we have uh, old energy pushing back. I think it would be useful, frankly, to have some people between these two uh, oncoming vehicles, um, the social side and the kind of crisis um, and opportunity that we're, we're, we're facing with um, the need for greater social justice. And so a lot of times those folks get caught in the middle uh, and get the squeeze literally. Um, but it is very much a time where uh, we don't have the luxury, if we ever did, of tackling one crisis at a time, but certainly all our um, efforts aimed at addressing climate change have to be understood that we have economic, political, social, health crises going on um, at, the, at the same time. So we've had responses and we've had responses over the years. They've often been kind of, um, well, as one of them, I can say dull scientific responses, right? And that are critically important, but not uh, quite so dynamic. More recently, and you'll, um, you'll recognize both the, the famous and the not so famous young faces that are raising up in a really inspiring way uh, the agenda of responding to the climate crisis. And, um, and so that's a critical context that I think does create uh, a new moment, not just because we're seeing climate impacts uh, taking, um, taking shape in ways that are, are uh, tremendously worrisome and, and damaging, but also uh, we have uh, parts of our society finding their voice and demanding change and setting an agenda for addressing climate. Um, and so that's 
uh, positive and inspiring. And um, that's, I'm sure, many of the people tuning into the Science Cafe at the university, those are students uh, who are leading the way. And I know I have um, worked with quite a few of them who, who feel this way and are, are taking actions. And so um, it's, it's um, for those of us who've been working on it for a long time, it's, it's inspiring to see. And so today's remarks are in some ways kind of urging us to continue and uh, in some ways diversify our approach. So getting back in the game, um, we um, have change here in this country, in the United States, change that is coming in terms of how uh, at the national level we are approaching the issue of climate change for the previous four years, it hasn't been a priority. And in fact, it's been um, even uh, more than not a priority, but something that's actively been um, shunted to the sideline and, and kind of counterproductive from my perspective steps taken to um, address climate change. But the US is uh, expected to get back in the game um, with President-elect Biden saying, for example, and prominently, uh, and importantly, that the United States would um, rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, the 2015 uh, agreement among the uh, brokered by the UN among all the countries um, to take tangible steps uh, to address climate change. Um, and that's and encouraging. Jeff, mm -hmm. I was going to say, you actually have your, your first question, which okay. is about the... Paris Climate Accord. Um, the question is, what's the process by which the U.S. will rejoin and how quickly do you think that will happen? Uh -huh. um, it's, uh, I'm sure they will make it happen as quickly as possible. Um, President-elect Biden has indicated he will make those take those steps on day one. Um, I think it's um, a matter of months rather than uh, years. Um, so I don't have the precise date, but I think part of what will happen is that uh, we will be participating in those fora in ways that are are tangible. I know um, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, has invited um, President-elect Biden and his representatives to attend the next Conference of Parties, which will be in Scotland. And so I think the international community will be very quick to welcome the United States back to the table, back into the room um, for that. Um, and that's critically important, but I think in, in my, as my next slide suggests, it's absolutely necessary, but wholly insufficient to meet the scale of the problem, right? So the international negotiation, it's the, it's the most um, frequently cited, it's paid the most attention in terms of climate change, and that's for really important reasons. It's a global issue. It's not one that any one country or even all countries missing than a couple others can, can tackle themselves. Um, and so um, that, that UN level is absolutely critical. However, um, I'm maintaining that it's insufficient um, because in part, treaties, not surprisingly, that require consensus and have all parties agreeing mean that you get a least common denominator. And so I think it's fair to be critical at the same time that we see it as necessary, critical of how far the Paris Accord requires countries to go. And so we need to go farther. And in part that um, the more ambitious approaches are not reflected in a multilateral environmental agreement like the Paris Accord. Um, and and so that's um, one reason that we need to look beyond. The other is that although it's not the problem is not as much as it used to be. Those the the Paris Climate Accord largely focuses on mitigation, so reducing uh, reducing the problem, bending the curve on on greenhouse gas emissions, um, and that's critically important. But what it neglects um, historically, and I would maintain still today is talking about adaptation and building resilience and how we respond to um, impacts of climate change that we're seeing already and those that are baked in the future but are baked into the system so to speak because the momentum of those greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere and they're going to be there for a while and that those dynamics are going to continue to play out so we have to also be able to pursue adaptation 
and building resilience to those impacts at the same time that we're trying to reduce the problem, bend the curve. Um, and then finally, as I said, national governments are absolutely key, but we, this is really an all hands on deck scenario. We have to have all actors engaged. And so again, we focus on that international level, but we can't stop there. And that's in part the theme of uh, the couple of cases I'm gonna share with you today. And I pulled out that we're gonna need a bigger boat because it really is uh, a bigger challenge than just having the climate change folks address it. It's something that crosses all sectors and all parts of, of, of um, how we organize our economy, where we live, what we eat. Um, these are all, um, these are, uh, it's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be a much bigger boat than just the folks sitting around the diplomatic table at the UN tackling this. It's more, it's for more than just the climate scientists and the lawyers. Hey, so Jeff, mm -hmm. can I ask another question? So sure. With that in mind, where you're saying that it's not just the government, uh, the context of this question is, is how far did we fall behind in the last few years and how resilient are we and able to maybe make up some ground? Right. Um, well, I think the we will see how far we fell behind. I think we there are certainly lots of... Um, um, lost opportunity and lost time. I think we've fallen behind in everything from, say, talk, start talking about some of these additional actors that need to be at the table. <clears throat> Excuse me. From the perspective of the private sector, there is a tremendous opportunity, uh, economic opportunity, in developing the technologies that move us away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Those are incredibly valuable markets. They're technology-driven. Um, some of that innovation and um, scaling up has gone on still in the United States, including right here in Athens, Ohio. We have a dynamic renewable energy economy in southeastern Ohio with some real leaders that have clear um, connections to the community and to the university. And at the same time, um, we're not making um, the investments and providing the support that the federal government can do in terms of helping with research and development and uh, creating uh, big buyers. And we'll talk about the impact that um, public purchasing can play by a key actor. So um, that's just one sectoral example. Um, I think um, we're still in the game. I think part of what makes it a hard question to answer is that um, I think we've lost a lot of trust um, and folks have found other partners. They know that uh, we need to be there and we need to be part of the solution. Um, but I think in some ways how we've fallen behind is that um, we're not seen as a reliable partner in ways that we might have before. <clears throat> so, yeah, so, um, but that's a good question and it remains to be seen. It's the right question to ask. Um, and I think a part of Part of this is prioritizing um, how we try to how we try to catch up in the multiple fora that are so important for doing so. Um, so um, the title of this was pursuing climate resilience. I figured I, I really should define some terms, so to speak, in terms of what we're talking about. And I don't know whether resilience is an organizing principle, but for that very reason of kind of the mitigation, oftentimes seen as in competition with adaptation. Um, that resilience has emerged as a as a term um, that obviously goes beyond and comes from other areas as well beyond climate change, but one that um, is commonly um, looked to from the Stockholm Resilience Center and Carl Folke and the folks who've kind of pioneered this work and applying it to climate change is. Uh, defining as the capacity for a social ecological system. So merging and connecting the social and the ecological critical. And not So it's not a, just a science in the natural world. It's, it's the merger of the social, the economic, and the ecological. Um, but it's a, a system that is, absorbs stresses and maintains function in the face of external stresses opposed upon it by climate change. So in that classic sense of resilience, taking a hit and being able to bounce back. But it goes in this realm beyond just coming back to stasis. And it, it needs a resilient system needs to adapt, reorganize, and evolve into a more desirable 
configuration that improve the sustainability of the system, leaving it better prepared for future climate change impacts. And so it's a process um, as well as well as a kind of an end state. Um, and that's what, in this case, um, we're going to use um, resilience to mean in terms of understanding where we're going today. Um, I mentioned more than coming back to, to stasis, more than just hanging in there. Love this photograph that one of my students shared with me, um, where the tree is is uh, surviving, but we need to do more than just hang in and survive. Uh, we need to find ways to be resilient, flexible, and and um, and thrive rather than just survive. Um, like all concepts, uh, plenty of critics and critiques. Um, and that's always going to be the case. In some ways, the very flexibility that is appealing to some is what uh, turns others off and says it's squishy and can mean too many things to too many people. Um, but it does seem to have, and there's some good work um, that has come out recently, um, looking across the various definitions of resilience and also how they're received and understood by different communities. And at a time where we know that we are in this country and around the world um, divided in ways that are not uh, conducive to productive response, uh, I think the words matter and words matter if they are ones that allow for collaborations across some of these divisions and finding common interests and um, pursuing some shared principles, moving away from uh, hot button framing of them, uh, even if there's um, kind of uh, decidedly what one might perceive as unfair or even unscientific understanding of, of some of those terms, uh, finding, finding a way to yes uh, really does matter. And I think resilience gives us some hope in that. Um, and it also suggests because resilience is a term that resonates outside the climate world, that it is something that makes it easier to bring all actors to the table, not just the climate one. So the fact that it has come and has many um, origin sources in different fields um, from biology to engineering and, and, and beyond, um, I think that's important um, for its utility in, in fashioning responses. Um, so I want to share three stories of pursuing climate resilience in unexpected places. And as I said, also maybe with unexpected people. Um, trying to reach beyond the usual suspects to illustrate my premise that it can't just be left to those who have climate change in the title of their portfolio um, or th those who see it as their number one priority. Um, and so uh, I'm going to tell one first about security, which is kind of how my initial and still ongoing um, experience of putting some different worlds together. Uh, a second one that's a newer area for me, and um, I'm pleased to say brand new collaborations. I'm learning a ton from, from other colleagues and also, uh, as you'll see, have opportunity to be part of our local community innovating in this space and thinking through um, these links with our experience experts. And finally, um, just to make sure that we understand that with change comes uh, challenges and um, sometimes even with well-intended steps, there are uh, negative consequences or backdraft dynamics that we need to be sure to avoid. And so I have, um, Bit of a cautionary tale from one of the areas that are kind of mixing both curricular and research work uh, in the Balkans with our environmental peace building program. So let's jump into the first one. Security, what's climate change got to do with it? Which is, um, since I've been working on the intersection of environment security and climate security now for, well, since I was the age of the students here um, at the university, uh, I've heard this question a lot, and it's a reasonable question, but one that I hope I can illustrate um, quite briefly. Um, I, I can go on, uh, trust me, on this one, but um, uh, a discussion that I think is is rich and interesting. So when I was uh, just finishing up university and came to Washington, D.C., uh, the world, um, my world, as somebody focusing on international relations and international environmental issues, uh, were turned on its head at the time up until then from the end of the world war ii to the end of the cold war it was about u.s soviet competition and um 
1989, 91, this a picture of the wall coming down in Berlin. Um, those working in the foreign policy and the security policy space were to suddenly totally discombobulated. The policies and the perspectives and the priorities and the tools to ensure security uh, all came into question. And so that was the mix in which I came to um, Washington, D.C. to try to find ways to plug in and focus on, on topics. And so it was in that context that then I came to ma marry the issues of uh, environment and then later on climate change and questions of security. This was where we were <laughs> metaphorically in terms of lots of tumult trying to figure out the success successor uh, approaches to containing the Soviet Union um, as the Soviet Union no longer existed. And it, what it meant was some of these light bulbs were not new issues, but issues that um, suddenly were able to emerge from the tumult and get, get um, attention in a foreign security policy context. So think of one of those as environment, one of those as health, one of those as poverty and development. These were issues that then could rise in priority and not be shunted to the side um, in in foreign policy terms. And so it was still messy, it was still battle, but that was what I then kind of came in and I, I grabbed onto that light bulb that was um, linking environment foreign policy. We really had to rethink our assumptions. I found out right away and every day have this. On the one hand, a lot of the world, we have to understand, sees those focused on environment and climate as as um, kind of well-intentioned but naive uh, tree huggers trying to, futilely to wrap their arms around um, the problem. And from this kind of going the opposite direction from the security side, the perspective that uh, security institutions do use force and they're good at blowing things up. Um, but in fact, there's a lot more um, to um, who is involved in providing security and defining security and that there are a lot of uh, additional tools in the toolbox from that security perspective and characteristics of that sector that make it worth engaging. Um, so a pulse of attention that came to climate security that was kind of 06, 07, so not as early as the end of the Cold War, that was environment security, but climate change was still seen as over the horizon, distant, incremental. Um, but the science was moving so fast in terms of uh, how um, it wasn't over the horizon. It was a now issue, and it was the change was happening much faster with much um, more drastic impacts. That was getting attention, and particularly prominent disasters. While we had them here in the United States, it was more impactful even uh, abroad, uh, even more so here, where it kind of changed the politics and brought these issues together. Our national foreign policy and defense uh, community started paying attention, doing some of their formal assessments that <clears throat> that looked systematically at these issues that, again, had largely been seen as outside the purview of security actors and started saying, no, actually, there are, there are connections here worth, worth looking at. Um, I'll speak to a moment about the Security Council debates. Also, now, at the same time that those traditional security institutions were looking at it, the climate and security were linked um, through a very different lens, the lens of small island states that said, we're facing an existential threat to our existence, very existence from sea level rise. And so absolutely, this is a security issue and the UN should pay attention to it. And finally, it's worth noting that those advocating for environment saw some um, uh, perceived advantages in having the security community engaged um, because that had a kind of approval and interest from wider swaths of the political spectrum than just strictly uh, the environmental realm. Um, and this is one of many examples, but um, the National Intelligence Council, think of it as the kind of think tank and assessment team of the intelligence community. And so it wasn't that climate change was creating a new kind of, of conflict um, and it was a brand new reality, but it was something that was going to have exacerbating impacts or threat multiplier impacts on other dynamics that were critical to the stability of states, to issues of war and peace, certainly to issues of uh, poverty and livelihood and ability of uh, communities and countries to feed themselves. Um, and so at a level that did um, uh, aggregate up to threaten 
uh, state stability and, and critical political institutional questions. So the UN Security Council was the first time ever that the UN Security Council in 2007 had tackled an environmental issue of any kind. Um, the climate change, the Brits brought it to the floor then. Um, the Germans have twice subsequently, um, the Swedes and such, and last year, last two years have been pushing it prominently. Uh, it still does not uh, go on without debate. There are some who feel it does not belong in the in the Security Council as a security issue, um, particularly the Chinese and the Russians, um, as permanent five members it really matter. Um, but this is an area where um, the discussion has become more common. Um, of course, you know, speeches are great. Uh, action is different, uh, and, and action is what's needed. Um, and so, there we can talk. Maybe if people have questions about some of those, I do have one example here. This is a cover of a report showing shoring up stability. One of the spinoffs of uh, G7, Group of Seven um, uh, Foreign Ministers request for a report that um, uh, I and some of my students were fortunate to be able to contribute to. Um, and then the Security Council is actually briefed on the case of Lake Chad. And it's a really complex case in some ways, um, much more complicated than it would seem, but one that has a kind of convergence of, of questions of security, peace and conflict, as well as big environmental change. Uh, questions of how those both connect to poverty and livelihoods. Um, and so it is playing out with greater priority and focus and analysis on, on issues, so to speak, on the ground. Um, at the same time, a totally different angle on this, and I apologize, it's a big jump, but these are some examples of how security institutions, the Department of Defense is the largest consumer of energy of any um, entity in the country, and it, so it really matters um, if they're making a transition to to solar. Why would they make it? Well, maybe it's cheaper. Um, increasingly, it can be cheaper. It's also more flexible and more resilient, right? So if you're not on a big grid that goes down and you have really important um, security missions, that's actually something that's of great value. Um, and so there's a perception increasingly that uh, addressing climate change threats are part of ensuring that the security um, forces can be able to show up and do their jobs. And at the same time, also that uh, being greener actually increases their resilience to achieve their objectives. And so here is one where um, it's not a case for the military should be the solution set for climate issues, but it is are opportunities to build alliances to bring to bear their purchasing power and their priority and their voice to making that green energy transition that's so critical to um, addressing climate change and building climate resilience. Um, I also, in addition, I mentioned up front that in addition, there's more than use of force and more than the ability to blow things up, so to speak. Um, by definition, a security approach is a precautionary principle approach, something that we need much more of on the environment and climate side, right? Um, maybe not doing something if you don't know what the results are, rather than waiting till there's scientific proof uh, that it is a problem before you stop doing it. They prize redundancy and flexibility. They're routinely making life and death decisions in the face of uncertainty, and so for a time, when opponents of taking climate change seriously said, well, we'll do it when we know more about the climate science. Um, but this was a very strong voice from the security institution saying, we're not the solution to climate change, but you all need to understand that um, from a risk analysis perspective, you need to make decisions in the face of uncertainty all the time. Bad things happen if you wait around for, uh, for more information. Um, lots of use of scenarios and role-playing gaming, which we do some in the environmental realm, but it's not the same as our climate models. Um, this is something that, uh, frankly, it's a struggle to get um, some of these methods seen as methods in a scientific realm, and that's part of a dialogue that we're um, helping support in terms of understanding environmental science and uh, U.S. national security institutions with um, um, funding from uh, NSF, which has been very helpful. Um, and and so in that sense, I think it's a model that we can look to for where for for a number of parts of the security institutions, they see climate resilience advancing 
their non-climate related missions. And so the more um, partners that we can find for whom climate resilience is a net positive on their priorities, I think we have a greater probability of making progress on climate um, because it serves these multiple purposes. So that's story number one. Story number two, very different, and one that, um, as opposed to working on for 30 years, as I have on the environment security, this is a year or two, frankly, um, and it's the experience experts. Well, who are the experience experts? This is the term that I um, love for um, uh, describing uh, older adults in our community. Um, and this came up um, quite in some ways by accident, literally around the family dinner table. So um, the woman pictured here uh, is Dr. Holly DeBelko, who's a professor of social work at Ohio State University. It also happens to be my sister. And so for years, uh, we talked about her specialty and focus on gerontology and social work and older adults, making, um, trying to support them in all sorts of ways. And they're doing that through this age-friendly Columbus, which is which is a community partnership effort, but is part of the Ohio State College of Social Work. And we always kind of lamented that we couldn't find a way to work together. But then she started telling me about, well, what is this age friendly? What are they focusing on? And I was interested in her work, but I wasn't thinking about it in connection to my own. And then she said, well, it's actually a World Health Organization. So it's an international standard and these are being pursued all over the world. So that got my interest because I'm focused on international and AARP, which is obviously a very powerful um, domestic advocacy organization for older adults in the United States. They're the national partner. And so these bullet points are what they were focusing on to make communities more livable, more age-friendly for older adults. So a couple things popped out of there, transportation, housing, um, a lot of focus on infrastructure, social participation, and um, Suddenly, I'm like, well, you know, this is about sustainability and climate, building climate resilience. These are the areas that we need to focus on. These, you know, is there a prospect for intersection? Uh, and how much or how little are these efforts taking into account that we're going to have a warmer world? And that's going to pose some new and different threats and opportunities for older adults. And it turned out. Um, her line, I think, was, I can tell you the difference between weather and climate change, but beyond that, we're just not engaged in this topic. It's like, okay, so there's there's room for engagement. And you know, the climate science, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which has got to be the world's largest kind of literature review, I was fortunate and privileged to be one of the lead authors for the fifth assessment, the last uh, time the whole assessment's been published. Another one's underway right now. And so uh, I went back and looked at the three volumes and 30 chapters apiece and, and really, uh, along with some students, dug into what does it say about older adults and, and impact on climate change? We're consistently recognized as a vulnerable community, but then we don't say anything else about what it means for them or what you would do differently, how you would adapt, how they can be part of a solution set, what are the unique threats that they pose to uh, that climate poses to them as a uh, recognized vulnerable group. So we, we we kind of, there was a point of intersection, but seemed like there was a lot more homework to do. So that's what we've been trying to do. And uh, as you saw in this bullet point, what we've done then now is put together sustainability and climate resilience as another domain, as they're called, uh, in, in tackling it. And um, Here's my sense of, you know, uh, the most obvious, of course, are increased extreme weather events and heat waves and what that means for, for older adults, right? So there are some real clear vulnerabilities. And this is one area where the, where the science is advanced and the research is advanced in terms of what that means. But I'd like the, the feed in the pool because to me that was kind of, uh, in some ways, the seriousness with which solutions um, were offered. It was... It was not very serious. Uh, that looks looks fun and enjoyable, but um, there are far more complex responses that are required. So we, uh, out of this, an unexpected collaboration was born between Ohio State and Ohio University. Uh, we call it the Gray-Green Alliance, both for older adults and the environmental considerations, climate considerations, but also because it's between the two universities, trying to systematically think about how um, older adults are both 
threatened um, as well as opportunities that might come. So as I mentioned, the vulnerability that comes with extreme weather events, um, add in the COVID adaptations that really undercut one of the primary ways that you address these threats, which is the social networks that allow you to go in and check on folks um, and, and, and make sure that they're doing well when we're facing these stresses. So it kind of exacerbates it. Um, and then sometimes even, um, again, well-intentioned sustainability efforts that don't take full account of the specific needs um, for older adults. So lots of excitement around autonomous vehicles, but not necessarily a lot of consideration for accessibility for this key constituency, um, our, our, our neighbors, our, our parents, our friends, right? Um, but also some opportunities. You know, that's why I like this experience experts. Um, lots of life opportunities dealing with adversity and uncertainty, which is what we are facing uh, increasingly with uh, climate change. A really powerful voice and advocate. So let's um, understand that there are political opportunity and power there that those interested in climate building climate resilience could have some be helpful to have some more friends and allies in that. Certainly a popular constituency. So actions taken to try to make communities more livable or age friendly for older adults, um, making it more resilient for them has the benefit of making resilient for all of us and um, potentially leading uh, to changes that advance the climate agenda in ways that um, don't lead with climate, but do advance the agenda. So this is an hey. area that, yeah, sure, Rob. You have a question. Um, okay. So the question is, is there any data about how people across different age demographics use, view climate change? Um, so do people of different ages view climate change differently, I think is what they're trying to say. Yeah, I, so I think that work is there. Um, I would hesitate to be uh, firm in kind of reporting on it. Uh, I think it has been clear that there's some correlations with it being high, a high priority uh, for youth and younger populations. It, it, it consistently emerges as a high priority. I think you can also find it recognized as a high priority uh, in other age demographics as well. There's some real challenges in that, of course, um, that there's a difference between asking about priority and then some follow on questions about how much you're willing to spend, how much you're willing to change your behavior and such. And I think there might be um, some separation there. Um, I think there are a number of reasons why from a kind of intergenerational um, equity perspective that older adults are starting to think about how can they ensure a better world for their children and their grandchildren. And so there's a strong, th those older adults who come to climate change, um, like many that we have uh, leaders on this in, in our community, um, cite that um, uh, perspective. That's a very good question. We should we should uh, dig into it. I would say uh, Yale Climate Connections um, is a place where often they're reporting on the Pew polls and and such. It would allow one to break that data down by by age demographics. So um, there's some good sources out there. Um, so finally, on on the, to end uh, story number two. So I'm pleased to say, in part uh, with many, many hands making light work, although it's still a heavy lift, Athens and a Athens City and Athens County together um, is now an age-friendly uh, community uh, registered with AARP and pursuing the five-year process of uh, assessment and then strategy and then implementation. And we have, um, succeeded in adding sustainability and climate change formally as one of the domains that has its committee. So if you're interested in uh, connecting all ages and all um, folks are welcome, uh, feel free to reach out to me with an email that I'll list at the end and can connect you with domains for all these different topics if you can be interested in ones other than this. But it's one where we have a very interested public leadership and private leadership um, and we're looking to bring more and more people in um, so that we can make our community more livable for all, particularly um, through for older adults um, in ways that include 
um, climate resilience and sustainability. Third and final story, uh, beware the backdraft dynamics. And I'll go probably quickly here and I can answer questions, but want to make sure we have time for more Q&A. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, the Balkans, so you know, from Athens County to the Balkans to New York Security Council, we're kind of running all over here. Um, I've been very fortunate to have a study abroad program and partnering with the Office of Global Opportunities, International Peace Parks Expeditions, and Todd Walters to take students. Uh, I think we've gone six of the last seven years to the Balkans, to particularly um, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Albania. Uh, you can see the yellow um, arrow points to where those three countries come together, and then there's a blow up of what is a proposed peace park that really is an ecological boundary rather than a political one. Um, you will remember, hopefully, that uh, this used to be one country, um, at least Kosovo and Montenegro were part of the, uh, Yugoslavia, which broke up when the Cold War ended. Uh, and so as uh, just 20 years ago, I guess, would be the end of the fighting between Kosovo and Serbia, that Serbia did not want Kosovo to break away. So this is a post-conflict setting. And so um, starting back in 2002 at the Wilson Center, we pursued this topic of environmental peace building that climate was part of, um, but brought us over there to understand how the ecological interdependence also could go along with economic and social and be a, a way to bring folks together, hopefully in a post-conflict setting and, and pursue peace as well as uh, sustainable development. Um, so how does this connect to our pursuing climate resilience in unexpected places? Well, not surprisingly, uh, for these countries that are not inside the European Union, they'd like to be part of the club um, for economic reasons, for political reasons, to hedge their bets against those who controlled them before and uh, reasserting control. And so uh, they'd like to be part of the EU. And part of being in the EU is taking climate change seriously and lowering your CO2 emissions and transitioning to renewable energy. Um, and so that's something that the EU uh, incentivizes and these countries are being trying to be responsive to. So hydropower, as we know, is one um, form of renewable energy or uh, non-carbon based source of energy. And this region is rich in coal. So um, the kind of the most and worst um, fossil fuel based uh, fuel. Um, and so hydropower has been popular incentivized with all sorts of financial incentives. However, um, this headline uh, from PRI The World shows um, the danger of free flowing rivers being dammed up for cleaner energy. Um, it goes beyond that with um, the challenge of, and here's a, a report by a number of, of environmental NGOs that kind of walk through uh, who's benefiting and essentially very little energy being produced, highly disruptive, opposed by local people. The labor is often not local, it's often brought in. The electricity that's being generated is often moved out of the country. And in the case of Montenegro, it's largely friends of the president who are the ones benefiting. And so here where it's a kind of this backdraft dynamics is what we at the Wilson Center have called the potential for conflict and negative uh, uh, kind of spin-offs, ripple effects of trying to do right by climate. The EU is trying to do right by climate, make a transition away from carbon-based uh, uh, fuel. At the same time, this is a real illustration where trying to sometimes do one environmental good can create an environmental bad or environmental, social, economic justice bad. And so, um, I think it is critical to remember as we look for different ways to pursue climate resilience that there's still big big choices and transitions will be benefit some and not others and really raises the priority of um, the word that's on the lips of so many today, which is uh, justice and, and social justice. And that really applies heavily here and goes back to my um, case of why it's critical that we embrace rather than run away from the multiple crises and, and not see them as, 
uh, is competing. So to conclude, just a few takeaways from pursuing climate resilience in the very all sorts of different contexts that I've had the privilege of doing that. I think we need to ask ourselves, is this progress, right? If we're staying in our silos, uh, I would maintain that um, there that we may uh, we may bring in a harvest, but it's not actually what we need to do. We need to break out of our silos for interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work with teams that aren't used to working together and, and working in places and with people that we're not used to working together. Um, so yes, we need to have silo busters. We need to go from here in Athens County up to the global level and and around the world. We need to build coalitions outside of our, the traditional climate circles. If it's just the climate people doing it, then we failed. Um, we can pursue climate resilience in ways that doesn't have to lead with climate, right? So some of these examples are meant to illustrate that um, we, maybe we lead with making our communities better for older adults and we have um, ways that we make it more climate resilient as well. I do think there is a quite understandable lot of frustration with incremental change and the, the call for transformative change is understandable and needed and necessary. Um, but we want to also uh, understand that these shouldn't be pitted against one another, that we have to take different steps to get to transformation. And so we shouldn't just throw out the incremental. We know they're going to be winners and losers, and so we have to be on guard against maladaptation or backdraft dynamics so that the justice frame stays at the table. And to conclude, if you know everyone in the room, whether that's your classroom or your club or the folks you're getting together with at home, you need to get out more because the point is we have to collaborate with folks that we're not we don't know and aren't used to working with and we may assume see the world very differently but there are ways that we can find some overlaps it may mean that we have to be more um, uh, flexible and resilient in collaborating on priorities that aren't putting climate change at the top of the list but it really are ways that they can bring benefits to our climate efforts um, and so in that vein Climate, building climate resilience really does mean going to unexpected places. Students, as always, are key to the work that I've uh, talked about today, um, and there's a lot of research behind it, and they've done a lot of that work individually with their um, master's thesis and in collaboration with me and other uh, partners. We do have a lot of partners, I'm proud to say, partners and funders that have been uh, instrumental to these different efforts and it's a real privilege to work with all of them. It's their work I'm talking about today um, and um, just happy to be part of that and welcome the chance to engage with questions and uh, be in touch with folks, whether that's on social media or email or um, here at the university. So Rox, I'll throw it back to you. Do you have some questions? I don't know if I should start negative or positive. Which do you prefer? <laughs> you know, we can bob and weave, whatever you like. <laughs> okay, so let's start with a little bit of negative and then we'll get a little more positive. So uh, recently I read that we have reached the point of no return regarding climate change. Right. Um, so I saw that paper and I've seen the critiques of that paper. Um, it's some business professors doing modeling that, uh, um, what shall I say, the folks who were taking a critical eye were, um, were critical in part because there was some, from their perspective, technical difficulties in terms of, of the reductionist approach to um, it's particularly around kind of oceans and anyway, it reduced complexity in ways that they felt undercut the certainty of the conclusion. I think um, there is a temptation and an understandable one to try to communicate in, uh, with as much scientific evidence in as systematic a fashion what a large time sensitive crisis we're in with climate change in part because it does the actions we take today are going to have impacts for decades um, and so that momentum is built into our natural systems and will have real impacts for us and there are some things like uh, uh, species that we lose and lose for good and there's no going back um, and other 
ecosystems that um, are, are lost in on time frames that aren't lost for good, but are, are lost in, in very meaningful ways on a human time frame. I think, however, that the challenge can really become um, that there's a whole lot more diversity. Um, you know, the the they're going to be there's going to be there is tremendous suffering. There is tremendous or tremendous impacts in terms of food security and health, and what it means for disease vectors and um, and heat events. And there are going to be parts of the world that are really inhospitable to human habitation. Um, however, uh, the Earth's going to survive, and some I would think uh, humans are going to, but it's going to be a very different world. And so. Um, while I applaud efforts to try to uh, make clear how much a crisis this is, I think in part um, there's a there's an article that I've talked about and joked about writing um, for a long time because I think the danger of those very dramatic outcomes is the response can be. Um, uh, well, uh, fight or flight, right? I mean, you can either go to Court Street and drink off your worries because it doesn't matter, or you can, you know, stock ammo and go to the hills and go to the bunker. And none of the, neither of those responses are the ones we need, right? So that kind of uh, doomsday, I think, keeps us from seeing steps that we can take and should take, even if we recognize it's going to be a fundamentally different world because of this, the state of the crisis. Good transition to the next question. Okay, the Biden administration is expected to enact a wide ranging environmental and climate policy agenda. Mm -hmm. Which policies among these do you think present the largest possibility for opportunities and for, uh, sorry, backdraft dynamics? Right. So I think actually one of the most exciting things that President elect Biden has announced is probably one of the most boring, but I think it's really exciting. And so bear with me. Uh, at the very end of the second Obama administration, uh, President Obama uh, and his colleagues laid down a set of instructions for all government agencies, not just the Environmental Protection Agency or the Department of Interior, the ones that have environment and climate portfolios, but all agencies that were required to do assessments of what climate change made for, meant for their operations, to have strategies for how they would become um, less dependent on fossil fuels and make uh, changes that range from efficiency to just doing things differently um, that took climate into account. And I think that will both have an impact because of the size of the government. I think it will also drive innovation and demonstrate that we can um, move toward, move away from how we uh, fuel our economy uh, and do that in different ways. And um, I, it's not going to be the solution, but I think it's part of the solution. And so I'm quite excited about that. Um, in terms of the potential for backdraft, that's an interesting question. Um, I think there will likely be losers in the green energy transition. Um, and I think there are some instances where we need to actually be serious about uh, helping those uh, parties that are adversely affected. And I'm thinking about not just talking about, but actually supporting transitions in jobs and sectors that are dependent on fossil fuels and finding ways that um, beyond kind of uh, um, kind of facile, well, we'll just help you transition to a new job, right? It's it's more than that. It's about identity and it's about a job and it's about technical and um, it's about where you live and their jobs, but they're not where they're, they were before. Um, I do think there will also be losers uh, in terms of, um, of those who put bets on old energy. And there I'm, I'm, I'm less sympathetic uh, to, to cushioning that fall. Um, but um, it's a good question. We need to do some more backdraft analysis. It, uh, frankly, it'd be, again, a good problem to have and, and want to make sure it's the flagging of the backdraft dynamics is not seen as a, as a reason not to make these transitions. In some ways, the, the case for that analysis is so that we don't screw up the needed steps 
um, and and delegitimize some important tools that we have for making that. So, trying to be really conscious of of um, of helping as many as possible, not having unintended negative impacts. Um, a question about uh, climate change and the economy. Mm -hmm. So how much of an impact is there, both positive and negative, on the economy? Wow. Um, well, uh, you know, I think it's, um, there's a lot of diversity there. Um, I think if you are sitting in uh, the Gulf Coast of the United States today, uh, or let alone in Central America, the poor people that are facing their second Category 4, if not 5, uh, hurricane in two weeks, um, that that's a devastating impact on their economy. And again, it's not climate change causes the storms, but the, the correlations um, that we're seeing between increased frequency and or intensity of storms, it depends where you are in the world in terms of of that, but it's pretty clear that the storms that we're having um, are more intense as a result of climate impacts. And so what that means for the economies of those communities that are affected by storms in the Gulf, fires in the West, um, flooding in all sorts of parts of the country. Um, and, and so in that sense, it is one that um, is deceptive in part because it's not that they're necessarily new phenomena, but the, the, the rate and the nature of these changes um, are ones that fundamentally uh, affect the economy. Uh, on the flip side, like I said, if we can be intentional about um, leaning into this transition, that in fact it can actually you know, help the economy in that it lowers um, uh, the burden of disease from uh, poor air. Right and lowers asthma rates and um, and improves health. That that actually is a boon for the economy because our people aren't sick <laughs> or as sick, and they're able to work and they don't have the health costs and such. And so it's really complex. Um, but uh, and there are people who spend a lot of time um, systematically documenting that. But really, it does depend where you sit. Um, but you have to be engaged to try to minimize the negatives and maximize the positives. And um, hopefully at the federal level, we will be more so. I should say there are many um, leaders that are not sitting in Washington, and it's critically important to remember that governors and mayors and businesses and NGOs are kind of despite what Washington does, uh, forging ahead. And in part because they have those uh, kind of day-to-day -day realities that may be still um, removed from senators who want to be obstreperous on these issues. And so um, I think those are places that we can look to for, uh, for innovation in documenting and addressing the economic impacts. So a question came in. I don't know if you know this, but uh -huh. what kind and of, what kind of an effect has COVID had on the climate? Ah, uh, well, um, how about I answer a related question, which is how are they connected? <laughs> how are they connected? Um, I think uh, one of the there there are. Yeah, there, there are a number of angles, right? Uh, and this is maybe cl climate, but certainly environment, right? So if one of the big challenges to the climate change problem is um, increasing CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions, well, there are a couple different ways. We've talked a lot about the burning of fossil fuels. We haven't really talked about deforestation as a release of the carbon that is stored in those forests. Well, deforestation has many causes and many impacts. One of them is as we defor deforest and change how we use land, um, we are coming in greater contact with wild animals. And then particularly when you couple that with food systems, with people living uh, in proximity to wild animals and consuming them, um, then suddenly you start connecting to the questions of wet markets and the jump of um, 
uh, of, of zoonotic diseases and, and diseases jumping from wild animals to humans. And so that is the uh, origin of COVID. And it's one that um, has a really complex story, but a, a pretty clear story that is um, has a level of scientific certainty to understand that there are multiple reasons why land use change, and particularly deforestation of, of, of wild habitats is, is something that has real, real dangers involved in it. Uh, and that is um, uh, contributing to the climate problem through the release of CO2 from, from the burning and clearing of those forests, but also connects to this um, COVID. I do think like so many things, the, the changes that we're having to make um have have some impact have impact on efforts around climate change it's been i'm sure very frustrating for young people who were so actively <clears throat> protesting uh and having their voices heard on the climate issue that now it's um less safe to do so um i think there are some instances where economic activity has gone down and so some have talked about declining emissions there but um I think the expectation is that that will be um, temporary in ways um, that um, some suggest that we kind of build back better and use this pause as an opportunity to think about how we organize ourselves and how we change since we've been forced to change by the disease. And so, you know, it could be positive if, for example, people fly less. Um, uh, air, air travel is tremendously carbon intensive. Um, probably the most carbon intensive way to move around. And so if we just realize that we don't have to get on a plane for all those meetings and Zoom works, then um, you know we may realize some benefits towards addressing climate mitigation. Well, on that hopeful note, I think I am going to thank you very much for this really engaging cafe and um, just thank you. My, uh, thank you, Rox. I appreciate the opportunity and opportunity to engage and I hope uh, folks will follow up, particularly if you're interested in age-friendly Athens County. There are a whole bunch of folks who are really interested in pursuing this and we'd love to have more. Thank you.